Hello and good evening and welcome to the Alliance of Independent Authors um, Advisor Interview and this uh, month we have, are delighted to have as always, uh, Ms Jane Friedman, writing guru, publishing guru, um, just absolute font of knowledge about everything you need to know but particularly about a subject that is close to all our hearts which is money and the business of writing and how we can, while it, it um, those two are often set up in opposition to each other somewhat strangely perhaps and um, how we can actually make our living as writers is a subject that I know an awful lot of you are interested in and want to know more about and Jane is the woman. Uh, so welcome Jane. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. And we will start by talking about your latest venture because, of course, it hits this uh, right on the bull's eye. You have started a magazine called Scratch. Tell us all about it. Well, it's a digital magazine focused on the intersection of writing and money and life. And uh, it came about in conversations with uh, a woman who runs an initiative called Who Pays Writers. Um, so for about a year, uh, Manjula Martin is her name. She ran a, this Tumblr-based project and it asked writers to submit reports about how much they were paid for writing at this or that site or magazine. And, you know, obviously that interested me very much. And in fact, having come from Writer's Digest, we, you know, published the big Bible of Writer's Market, which is, you know, a huge phone book of places that pay for your writing. Um, Angela's take is a little bit different because um, it's all writer reported rather than editor solicited and verified. But anyway, we got to talking and we both share this passion for transparency around the business side of writing and publishing. And we wanted to do something that would help bring more conversation and open discussion about how money is made, who's making it, why or why not. Um, and, you know, both on a very personal level, like stories of people who have either struggled or who have able to make a living through writing, uh, as well as on a more professional level, like book marketing. Where do you even begin, uh, whether you're traditionally published or independently published? So, you know, it's all for an audience of writers, um, but there, there's definitely some bleed over into basically anyone who's trying to make a living from their art. Okay, great. And um, you have what edi edition are you on now? I've I've seen your launch, uh, which is nicely available on your your new website. Where what's where st what stage are you at in the publication cycle? Will it be monthly, quarterly? What what are the plans? Uh, we're starting as a quarterly, and the first official issue that you have to pay for comes out in January. Uh, but there is a free preview issue available right now at our website which is scratchmag.net. Which is rather marvellous, I have to say. And uh, we have uh, extracted one of the articles for our self-publishing adv advice blog. And there's lots there and lots and lots uh, of interest. So is that essentially the formula we can expect going forward? Is there a formula? Can you tell us about the breakdown in each issue? I don't know that we've yet settled on a particular formula. It's still evolving a lot. but there will probably be somewhere between 8 to 10 pieces per issue. Some of them will be, probably at least two pieces per issue will be personal essays from people commenting on how they've, some element of how money or finances have affected them in their career. Um, there will always probably be, for the foreseeable future, a piece on contracts. So the preview issue had a very long piece on the grant of rights clause in a publishing contract. I'm going to be following that up with the reversion of rights clause. <laughs> so important, issue. so dear to my heart. It was yeah. having a very good reversion of rights uh, yeah. clause in my contract that allowed me to make my graceful exit from trade publishing mm -hmm. into, into mm -hmm. author publishing. And I'm really, really grateful to that clause. It's terribly powerful and people often overlook it. Yes, they might not even even know what that phrase means. So, sure. um, and then you know the the remainder of it is maybe a combination of some service pieces, things that are informational and helpful, as well as reporting on various issues 
of interest to writers. For instance, I'm working on a piece about serializations, and I'm talking to probably a dozen different people who are working in this area, including Amazon, Wattpad, some authors, both independent and traditionally published authors who are trying serializations. So trying to see what what themes emerge and what is helpful for writers to know about that trend. Fantastic. Just coming back to contracts just briefly, um, it's my impression, and certainly from my, my informal research, which I do a lot of with Alliance members, that um, author publishers are not taking enough account of what is in contracts with distributors and platforms. And um, Do you have any comment on that? Do you have any experience in this area? Authors tend to be very scared of contracts, and I think to some extent I, I understand kind of the fear and intrepidation. There's a lot of legalese. Um, it's not necessarily straightforward. You may have never seen anything like it because um, publishing contracts are quite unique and specific to the industry. But once you decode a few certain words and phrases that get used a lot, it's really imperative that you understand what you're signing, since it can have very long-term ramifications on how you make money off your work. I think two of the most important areas for any contract, uh, reversion of rights, which we've just discussed, which stipulates how you get all the rights back to your work after licensing it to a party. And then also looking at the exclusivity that's demanded by the contract. So most contracts have a variety of both exclusive and non-exclusive demands tied up in them. And some exclusivity is reasonable, but it's all based on how much you know, you're getting paid, if you're being paid appropriately for that exclusivity. And so I think, above all, those are the two things, at, at minimum, you need to understand when you're signing a contract. How exclusive it is, like how is it going to maybe bind up your rights or prevent you from doing something else with that work? And then, should a time come when you really don't want to deal with that partner anymore, how do you get out? So. Sure. And I guess the third one would be territory. Yes. Yes. Territory, anything having to do with the sale of foreign rights or translations or where it's distributed, yes, also very important. OK. And uh, just to finish up on Scratch then, um, I'm assuming that it is aimed not just at book writers, so what proportion of the magazine each issue would you think would be relevant for those who write books, particularly, obviously, our, our core contingent to our um, self-publishing authors? Right. I would say, at the moment, it's roughly a 50-50 split, although certainly with the personal essays and some of the, some of the content applies to both equally, so, but at least 50-50. Okay, great. All right, my number one question, which was asked by more than one person, is what is Jane's number one tip for, uh, <laughs> for making money from writing? Well, <clears throat> I think one of the most important tips I have is actually having awareness around where the money's coming from, when it's coming, and if it's growing or declining, <laughs> mm -hmm. that seems awfully obvious. But you know, even I am guilty of not tracking these things as closely as I should. So, and it all starts with a very simple spreadsheet that shows the opportunity or the product or the book or whatever it is, how much you got paid, and tr and tracking that number over the long term. Now, that's a, that's a very big picture, high level strategy, and I'm sure part of the question you're asking is, how does someone who's not making any money now <laughs> start making their first dollars? So when it comes to that piece, I think you have to look at, there, there are usually two parts to any professional writing career. There's, well, there, there's the funnel or this large net that you're casting to get readers. Um, one of the most popular ways to catch readers or to get people into a funnel is through a blog. Um, social media. And that's why these things are recommended so often because they're very good nets for catching people and sending them down uh, the, sa the sales funnel. <laughs> Ooh, is that what yeah. we're doing? <laughs> mm. So a lot of what I see happening a lot is writers who are very active 
in that kind of at the very beginning of the funnel, very active in the social media and the blogging and catching people with all sorts of free content and interaction and discussion. That's all to the good. But they actually have no idea what to do with those people once they're in the funnel and like starting to head down the extreme end. <laughs> and so at the other end of the funnel is where you have something that people pay for. And obviously for, for most people that's a book of some kind. It doesn't always have to be a book. Sometimes I think people get really overly focused on selling a particular book. I mean, that makes sense, of course, for many novelists and fiction writers. But there are lots of other things you can do with your content um, that might not necessarily be a, a book download or a physical book. Can you give us some examples? Yes. Um, this, this, highly, this highly depends on the particular writer and what they're good at. Um, but obviously, if you're speaking or going to events, there's potential money to be made there. Um, there's also different packages of content, like bundles of content that you can do. If you have been playing a lot in kind of the free content realm, whether that's blogging or, or social media interaction, there are ways of going back to that and then taking it and repackaging it into something that's very useful, saves people time, is customizable. So there's, there's something called, um, I'm going to forget the specific name for it. I think, I think it's generative values. This is a, something that came from Kevin Kelly. He has a really wonderful blog post called Better Than Free. And he talks about the seven values you can attach to your content that people will pay for. They might not pay for the content, but they might pay for this other layer that's on top of the content, like the customization or the fact that it saves you time or whatever the case might be. So for example, um, on my website, I've got a, a blog archive of two years. For most people, it feels like a chore to have to go through all of those posts. One thing I have not done, but really could do at any time, and probably should, but I have other things I'm doing, is compile that into some kind of comprehensive resource so that people don't feel like they're slogging through entries that may or may not be relevant. And, and that they're just looking at what I've curated for them in kind of a beginning to end format. So some of these ideas I do think are easier to apply for a nonfiction author or a journalist perhaps, but there are also there, there are ways to make this work in, in the novelist world and I think the way that I most often see it happen is through different serialization efforts. So you may have you know the very early parts of the story available for free and you're hooking people in but by the end, uh, you know, you get to charge. Now, in Japan, with the, the advent of the cell phone novel, there were some very clever publishers who acquired these novels. And then if you wanted to read the ending, you had to actually go buy the book, even though it was free up until the point of the ending. Oh, oh. <laughs> I can hear the howls of protest if you try that one in America. I know, I know, right? Um, but Wattpad, you know, there is an environment where many people are serializing and making the whole work available for free in chunks, but then uh, there are some people who just want to buy the, the final edition with everything. They don't want to read it in chunks, or they're too impatient, or they prefer the print format. So the, it's thinking a little bit more broadly about the different ways you can package and deliver what you've got. Do you have examples of people that you feel are doing this particularly well? Um, some of my favorite examples on the fiction side have often, uh, I, I tend to go back to the same people, <laughs> but um, Seth Harwood and Scott Sigler are two of the earliest examples I can think of, like going back to 2010, maybe 2009, where they made audio versions of their books available for free. In fact, I believe you can still go to their sites and listen to any of their novels uh, without paying a dime. But as soon as you know you want a, a real edition of it, that's when you're going to start to pay. And for them, it it works. Um, let's see. The uh, there are a few guys who do the self-publishing podcast: um, mm. Sean Platt, Johnny B. Truant, and David Wright. And their funnel is similar to what I said before, where they release what they call seasons of works. So they have something called the Unicorn Western. <laughs> and so if you buy the whole season of that, it's going to cost you some money, but if you're just sampling the very first one, it's free. 
So, but that first one, I mean, that's a significant chunk of content. I think it's at least 20,000 words, if not more. So you kind of get the first episode, let's say, but then for the season you pay. Um, and then they also build in advantages for people who are their fans. So, for instance, if, you're, if you come to their work early and you're one of the first people you know, on the boat, you typically get it at a lower price than someone who has just discovered it like two years later. So that's, that's another you know, very smart way to go about it, to reward the people who are with you from the beginning. Absolutely. I think, you know, I agree with you in terms of watching. A lot of writers put a huge amount of effort into putting free content out there and connecting with their readers and, and with other writers and, you know, creating quite a nice platform for themselves. But in a, in a way, almost undervaluing what they've already created because they're constantly trying to bring in more people and more people and more people rather, rather than shaping up what they have in a way they have a, a band of happy people that they could mm -hmm. be drawing in a lot closer and um, that's kind of traditional business practice isn't it to to mm -hmm. sort of what do they call them they're already warm customers or you know you will know all, all the terminology tell us yeah so there you basically have um, you have kind of the very cold selling and then you know the more warm touch selling and so I think for social media, too many people tend to approach it as, you know, a very hard sell, or you could call it a cold sell, and where you're saying basically, buy my book, here's the link. Social media doesn't tend to react well to that. I mean, there are some people who can get away with it because, you know, they their followers are trained to look for specials or deals or discounts, and it can work in that way. But most authors' accounts are not going to work in that way. So social media is great for building networks and connections that then ultimately lead to sales, but social media should always be treated as, as that soft sell, and you obviously will have a link uh, on your profile to your website, and your website is more appropriate for the hard sell, where you are saying, now's the time to buy. Um, uh, here's the specific offer that I have for you. So I think that if people feel that social media doesn't work for sales, they're right up until a point. <laughs> it doesn't work if, if you're treating it like a bullhorn, um, unless you're during, there are exceptions for like very particular campaigns. If you're running a, you know, a 24 hour sale or there's something really particular going on with the launch of a book, those are special occasions. But by and large, you know, it's, it's a soft sell. And for instance, when I, um, if I have a class, that I'm teaching that has a pay component. Um, I don't like to talk about it more than once or twice on social media as far as doing a direct link or a hard sell. What I do instead, and this would be called a soft sell, is I create a blog post that offers some very helpful, useful content and so almost always content taken from the class itself. And I've repurposed it for a blog post. And so I give people you know, a little cheese cube I give them that taste of what I can do and what, what advice I can help give them or what I can help them with. And then, of course, at the beginning and at the end of that post, I say, if you enjoyed this, then here's the class. Um, and so I think there's, you have to have those cheese cubes <laughs> for, the, for the new people, for the people who may not know or trust you yet, who are just encountering you. You give them the taste. And then you have the deluxe cheese basket <laughs> with the whole cheese and special <laughs> cheese knife um, with a bow. And that's, you know, that's the premium product for, for people who, who are looking for that. And it's always a smaller percentage, you know, and that's why we think about the funnel because you lose people as they travel down the funnel. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. You're only ever going to get a small percentage of people. Sure. And... I'd like to talk for a minute, I mean, some writers are vegans, it seems, <laughs> <laughs> and um, this talk of cheese and any talk of selling, in fact, and, uh, and 
I, you know, I have some sympathy for this side this side of, of many writers, and I, I completely understand this psychology whereby your writing is a gift in a way that you, it's a gift that you get in terms of being able to do it, and it's a gift that you offer the world because you want to either inspire or educate or inform or amuse or entertain or whatever. And, and you know, all this talk of funnels and bringing people in, you know, and <laughs> stuffing them with cheese um, makes a lot of writers very uncomfortable. Can you talk to me a little bit about that psychology and, you know, what you think about it, you, you personally? Well, I'm definitely sympathetic to it. I mean, I, I came up through a creative writing program that was very artistic or artistic minded, I should say. Um, we didn't talk a lot about the business. Um, and so I don't know if it was something inherent in me or just my training in corporate publishing, maybe a bit of both. But it made me realize that, you know, art and business don't have to be antithetical to one another. Um, certainly that dichotomy is portrayed a lot and it is there to some extent but I think it's overplayed. I don't think it's as bad as it's sometimes made out to be. And especially if you, I think here's here's the big difference. The, the one, I can't reconcile this for people if, if this is how they feel um, because I don't feel the same way. And that is, if you're an author who doesn't care about your reader or your audience, in essence, you're the person writing alone, off, garroted, by yourself, and you just push your work out into the world, and then you go back and garret yourself again and write. And you're working as like this lone artist genius, and you don't care what other people think, because that's not your business to care. I have a, that's really hard to reconcile with the idea of marketing and promoting your work. I think that's, I don't think that's like the wrong idea of writing or art. I think it's a very romantic idea of writing an art, and I think it works for, let's say, an elite class of authors. Um, but I don't, I, I can't, I can't help people who feel that way. Sure. <laughs> It's when you say elite class of authors, do you mean because in order to do that, one has to have some other source of income, otherwise you can't? Right. You have to be supported by something, whether that's a university or a nonprofit or your publisher who is able to sell enough to pay you in advance to live on, your family wealth, <laughs> uh, a rich spouse, something like that. Um, so yeah, the, the bridge I try to make here is that if you want people to read you and you care about a readership and an audience, then it's very easy then to make the transition to marketing because marketing is really nothing more than helping, pe helping people who might be interested in your work find it, um, bringing it to their attention in a way that it's, it's a win for everybody. So. Certainly, I think marketing has been done in very poor, obnoxious, and um, <laughs> soul-crushing manners. <laughs> but that's not that's not the approach that I would ever advocate. And certainly, as soon as we start, if you ever start hearing people offer ultimatums or imperatives, or you must be on social media, or you must do this sort of marketing effort, you know, that's where the conversation is getting derailed because there's no must to this. It's really built around your own strengths and weaknesses and the unique qualities of your work and also how your readers or audience prefer to be reached because not every audience you know, is active on social media and some are very uh, action any more maybe than sometimes the author is interested in interacting with the reader. That seeks very nicely into a question that I have here, actually, which is precisely that. I am a writer who I don't believe that my um, audience is at all interested in me as a person or in, you know, any of the frills and, uh, around my writing. They just want what I write, um, but I want to grow my <laughs> readership. How do I do that? There's still many ways. To, to grow a readership that has that have nothing to do with social media. And I think we're finding out, especially in what I call the age of the algorithm, 
because a lot of discoverability is driven by online algorithms of Amazon, Google, uh, and the rest. You know, sometimes the best thing you can do to get more readers is to actually produce more work. Um, and some, and, you know, that work has to just meet the quality expectations of readership. Um, that's not like a, that's not putting a mission out there to produce as much low quality passive work as possible, but that sometimes all your readers want is more of what they've enjoyed. So focusing on that is a, a good marketing strategy. After that, you know, you're really looking at ways you can uh, encourage word of mouth among the people who are already your fans. And there are ways to do that that involve, you know, simply collecting email addresses of, of people who are interested in hearing about new releases. And when you have a new release, making sure your fans know and offering them incentives or reminders to tell their friends about, about your work. Um, and then after that, you know, you have sites where you can optimize your presence, like Goodreads or Amazon, where you can make sure you have a really thorough author page, everything is linked up, that when you are making books available, if you're self-publishing, that you're smartly categorizing and tagging them, and you're making sure that they're appearing where they ought to be appearing for those interested readers. So these are all things that fall under, you know, good marketing that have nothing to do with being all chatty and community-driven on social media. Yeah, I mean, in a way, I think of that as, as under the publishing umbrella, if you like, and, and, and I think of marketing as something that comes, they're almost like the basics that have to be there if you're going to deliver what's, you know, your product, uh, to use you marketeer's favorite word, <laughs> product and content. But um, I think of marketing as something that kind of is more than that, that is added on. It's an extra effort. And, uh, and I think it's something that almost every writer is, is expected to do now, whether they're trade published or, or publishing their own work. And one question here is, and you probably possibly won't be able to give a straight answer to this one, but what are Jane's top three platforms for marketing fiction? For marketing fiction? Well, everything, I have to add a disclaimer that since I don't do it myself, I can only tell you what I observe. But, you know, that might be just as good. Um, I, I can't get away from the fact that nearly every best-selling novelist I've encountered, it, particularly in the independent author community, they almost always have an email list driven from people who are visiting their website. And so I think this is kind of the number one platform that often gets ignored because email is seen as sometimes a very kind of old, passe technology. No one reads their email anymore. But, you know, there's, there's really nothing better than a direct connection to your reader through email if they themselves have signed up for that list and want to know when you have a book available. So that's a very simple thing to get started, assuming that, you have your own website. And all of, all of the things I'm going to mention right now are actually with the assumption that you've got your own website. I feel like that's like step zero. <laughs> okay. You really need your own turf that you own and control. I mean, I don't care if it's hosted by WordPress or if it's on Blogspot, but something that can act as a website for, you, for people to go to when they want to know more. And that's certainly if you're active anywhere else, whether that's Facebook or Twitter or Goodreads, Amazon, whatever. You know, people who love your work will very likely end up at your site at some point. And so having that email newsletter sign up or some way for people to subscribe or be notified about news, that's kind of like number one on my list of things to do. Um, with Again, with number zero being the website itself. Um, after that point, you know, I think this is where things change a lot from year to year. So it's very hard to say it, this is very effective versus that. But we're seeing that the social reading networks just tend to have a lot of influence on how you get discovered, if new people will try your work, and just generating word of mouth. So that includes things like Goodreads um, and also just kind of the small niche community sites like for romance or mystery or thriller that Hopefully, if you're writing in those genres, you already know what they are. But those places where people go to find out about new books, like uh, Dear Author for Romance, those, those are very powerful communities where people pay close attention to what new books are coming out and what their next new read might be. 
So those are areas where you might want to invest in paid media or advertising, you know, and, and think about uh, BookBub is another example where using email instead. Um, there are also literary publishing advertising networks um, that can help place your book in front of people who are most predisposed to, to buy it or at least try a sample. When you say literary publishing advertising networks, do you, do you mean, does that refer to books or are you specifically referring to literary fiction here? Um, books. Oh, sorry. Um, literary also, as in books, yeah. Yeah, and also, there's also one for literary people in general. Mm. So um, Author Buzz is one. It's run by MJ Rose uh, in the States. And she, you know, has an, a network of places where she can advertise your book and come up with a campaign that's suited to your genre and to who you're trying to reach. Um, I'm not going to remember the name of it, but there's ads on sites like The Rumpus, The All, The Millions, um, and Large Hearted Boy, some of the very popular what literary sites, but people who are bookish is the best way I can put it. Sure. And presumably then some of the review sites of the newspapers that are online and active like The Guardian in the UK is a particularly good example, I think. Right. Exactly. And as we did mention literary fiction there, and as, as it is a genre that people find particularly hard, I think, to market, whether that's because of the type of person who writes it or whether that's because it's just harder to reach those readers, um, I'm not entirely sure. But any, any tips around literary fiction? That's the nut. I haven't really seen anyone crack um, unless they already have a really well-built audience they reach directly, and those people are kind of like the outliers or the, bl the black swans. Um, I think one of the reasons it's difficult is because there's just such a smaller market for it, and it's very insular. Um, working at a literary journal myself, <laughs> I see how this community works, and it's just, it's, um, it's still very much a gatekeeper kind of place from, from my perspective. So you have to have the right people talking about it or recommending it or reviewing it or posting about it before people will start to take notice. That's not to say it's impossible, but you have to think really carefully about who you know and who's going to help you to help um, you know, build buzz and credibility, especially if you're doing it on your own. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yes, yeah, so um, nonfiction. Uh, we've 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 talked uh, quite a bit about fiction. Just turning to nonfiction briefly, there is a perception that writing and publishing nonfiction is much easier, and um, also that there are more options for financial advancement and and to reshaping content and so on, as you discussed a little bit earlier. Can you go into some detail here in terms of recommending um, some things that people might think about? Because even a fiction writer can write, perhaps, nonfiction to supplement their fiction writing yes. income. Yes, absolutely. I think the nonfiction area is really fascinating to me. I mean, that's my background. but personally, you know, and from an industry perspective, there's just so much opportunity. Um, and I think this is where we get into a lot of different multimedia strategies and opportunities. So, for instance, uh, one author I like to frequently reference is Chris Guibo. Hmm. He is an author in the States who started a, a blog called The Art of Nonconformity. And he only blogged, I say only, this is probably a lot for most people, he, he only blogged twice a week. And he started building an audience that really crystallized in under a year. And, he, and I think one of the reasons he succeeded so quickly is he had a very strong sense of who he was speaking to, and he was very disciplined about speaking only to that audience. And so before the year was up, he ended up doing a manifesto. And this is another interesting tactic that people can think about. It was called 279 Days to Overnight Success. <laughs> and in a, I, don't, I, don't, I know, right? I like it already, yeah. So in, I, it was about 50 or 60 pages, I think. It was a PDF. He lined out exactly how he got 100,000 people to start visiting his site in less than a year. And he was totally transparent about it, which, of course, I love. 
having talked about Scratch and then transparency mission. And he talks about exactly how much money he made and what his revenue sources are and how it all worked out. And you, one thing you notice is, boy, that's a lot of work, <laughs> but also that it's possible if you're focused and disciplined. And so that manifesto was a really interesting point at where he got even more people who became aware of him because people were passing that around as a really valuable tidbit cheese cube. <laughs> um, <laughs> And saying, wow, this is really amazing, and it was just a very inspiring piece that attracted more of the same to him. I've seen other authors use that kind of manifesto strategy as well, but manifesto has to be great. It has to be something people want to share. And so as of today, you know, he makes a full-time living on his writing, and it's some of it's speaking. Um, some of it is through traditional book publishing. A lot of it is through what, for lack of a better term, it's through sale of informational products through his own website. And so he has very, very niche projects um, about travel in particular and, and some other topics. So he's not discriminatory as far as, you know, what channel or medium he's producing content for. He, he dabbles in quite a bit. And if you look at some other nonfiction experiments, you see that people in many ways are are able to charge for video, or screencasts, or courses, or personalized coaching, or these informational products, or bundles of these things. It's, it, as long as you're giving people information that's helpful, that saves their time, that cuts through the noise, um, that resonates with you know a problem they want to solve, something they want to achieve, it's it's just easier to sell information because there's a benefit attached. But I the, the huge reminder I want to put out there is that information is, some, is valuable oftentimes in a different format than a book. So you have to base it on your audience and the, and the qualities of that information. Yeah, it's so interesting because I think Chris is an example of this. You know, um, a book, six ninety nine, but call it an information product, make it a download, which is, you know, easier, and <laughs> make them print it off themselves. And it could be forty nine dollars. Yeah. Um, uh, this fascinates me completely. You know, as somebody who who came up through the book business, and um, this idea of just I, I find it absolutely astonishing. Some of the products, again, that word, which yeah. are essentially small books. <laughs> That's what they are. They're small books, less than 50,000 words. They don't take a long time to write, uh, but because of the marketing. They are their cost, you know, their their pricing and their profit is is at a completely different level. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, would you be recommending that more nonfiction writers think about how they are putting their con content together in that way? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think, I think, I think everyone's experience is that when you you go to Google or you or you go somewhere looking for an answer to a problem or you're, or you're researching something, about, about all of us will get overwhelmed at some point if we don't already have some kind of trusted filter that we go to. So even if you're not able to uh, build content right away, like if you don't have the content to sell or repurpose or package, if you know enough about an area to act as a trusted filter, that can sometimes be the first and easiest step because people flock to trusted filters. I know I do. Um, so for instance, there's this great site which shows a really wonderful moneti monetization model at work. It's called The Wire Cutter. And The Wire Cutter started doing product reviews, um, blog posts, um, for each major category of gadget product. It's, it's more of a gadgety, geeky site, but they've, they've definitely broadened what they cover. And so they'll say, okay, here is the best lap laptop under $1,000. Or here is um, the best Android tablet. Here is the best uh, TV under 30 inches. And so they have like this three to 5,000 word product review or analysis of all of what, why this particular model or product is best in category. And they tell you about all of the other products that, that they also looked at. 
And so you feel like, oh my god, this just saved me like weeks of angst <laughs> trying to figure out which TV I was going to buy or which camcorder or which camera. Um, but the way they make money is when you click on a link, it takes you to Amazon, and then they get a, affiliate sales from Amazon. And this is more than enough to sustain the site. So, you know, and they're, they're acting as both a content generator and a trusted filter. And so there are ways that authors who have some insight into information-based fields where they can become that filter, link to Amazon or your favorite site that offers affiliate sales, and start monetizing your work that way. So it sounds like you are uh, perhaps advising, and again, there are no rules, as somebody once said, um, but advising a sort of a, a multi-stream approach to, to income. Absolutely, yes. I think in, in the current environment, you always want to have multiple streams of income. It's a horrible businessy word, but it's true. Um, so for instance, when I think about Scratch and all of the different ways we're thinking about how that gets built out. I mean, we have subscriptions that currently will probably come from three to four different sources um, because we have people who subscribe to the app, we have people who subscribe to a PDF, we have people who subscribe um, like at events, we have people who will subscribe uh, on an institutional basis. And then there's also, you know, we can start thinking about content licensing for that, selling it in a different manner to other sites. We can think about um, packaging up that content and selling it in book form after we have enough to do that. So it's really unlimited, and it's driven by what you see, how you see people behaving, how what things they search for on your site, where they spend the most time, and that starts to give you a lot of ideas for what to do. And presumably affiliate income also for Scratch, yes. but can you also talk about all the, you know, can we nail all the possible uh, ways in which content can generate income? Can you give us a list? Oh, but actually in the, the preview issue of Scratch, we had a little cartoon done on the main monetization methods. So, uh, and it, it's done in a humorous way. So while there's just straight up advertising, accepting advertising, you can put... Uh, Google AdWords on your site, um, and when people click on them, you get money. There's the affiliate income through Amazon, Barnes & Noble. I, all, just about every online retailer has an affiliate program. There's just uh, what we call e-commerce, like selling books, products, uh, services. And there's events, um, which is a really growing category for many media and publishing companies. Like Atlantic is a really good example of where they've spun off an event series. The New Yorker, too. So events are big. Um, sponsored content is another one that's growing tremendously. And this is where instead of someone advertising on your site, it's kind of like a content partnership. And their, you know, their brand is stamped on some content that you're producing. This is something I've actually just recently experimented with, where um, I'm working with Nook Press to do a series of sponsored posts by independent authors, um, offering lessons and tips, uh, what they've learned along the way. Uh, the first post went up about two weeks ago. Um, and it's, you know, it says at the top, this is sponsored by Nook Press, and it says it at the bottom. And then, but for me, because I, for a lot of reasons I won't go into here, um, Nook Press is paying me money, but then I'm, I'm giving that money to the writer because I don't normally pay writers for posts at my own site. So this is a nice way for me to pay someone, finally, <laughs> for their posts on my personal site. And it's also, I think, helpful for Nook, too, because they're getting, obviously, exposure to an, to an audience of people who may be interested in publishing with them. Let's see, did I... I I think I got them all. Okay. I may have missed one. I hope not. Now, can we turn to the life uh, dimension of Scratch? I'm really interested in that, money writing and life. And I know that an awful lot of people start writing because, um, you know, not so much that they want to actually write <laughs> because it's very hard work writing, uh, but they want to be a writer. And uh, mm -hmm. is that 
what you're talking about in the life dimension of, of Scratch or you know are you talking about being a writer actually is a, is a great life it's a great way to live and it puts you in touch with life itself I think at a different level perhaps mm -hmm. than if you weren't um, so what exactly is that dimension of your project I think it's to acknowledge that even though you know we're interested in the business and money side um, a lot of decisions get made based on factors that have nothing to do with money <laughs> um, and that sometimes business relationships um, really can get entangled in, in, in very personal matters. Um, you see this, you know, as someone who worked in corporate book publishing, life inevitably intruded into the process of doing a book with an author. Um, and it's some, it could be something very basic, like an author is sick, um, or an author has some kind of uh, financial pressure and they want their money earlier than what was contracted. Um, or they're having trouble meeting a deadline and do you still, if, if they're supposed to receive money, do you still pay them? And you know, these questions get a little more difficult to answer the longer you've been working with that person. Like, let's say it's their third book with you and you know, there's a lot of trust, there's a, there's a relationship there and you know that you can't just treat this person as someone who has no relation, to, like, they're just a business entity, they're a human being. So I think it's acknowledging the human side of all of these conversations and how difficult it can get. Um, and that many times editors and agents, you know, sometimes they pay or make decisions based on um, the kind of life they think that writer has and how much sympathy they have. I'm not saying that <laughs> you should act, you know, like a pitiable case to get more money, but that, you know, people have a heart, so they're, they're going to... They, they want people to s succeed and be able to have a comfortable living and choices do get made with that in mind. Okay, so it's very much the sort of life within the context again of, of business and money as, a, as, a, as an, um, an endeavour, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Well, I will read with great interest on that. I want to talk particularly about this, this term that's being put about a lot, um, the author as entrepreneur. And, um, you know, this idea that we're seeing a new breed of, of writer that maybe people didn't even know existed, or certainly that they didn't know they existed in such numbers. Could you talk to me a little bit about that? Because I know you have, um, you have thoughts about this. Yeah, I think this is often difficult to, when, when I'm advising new authors about this on, author-entrepreneur model, um, if someone is really still honing their craft, they're still very new, sometimes I'm reticent to, you know, give the whole entrepreneur, be an entrepreneur speech, um, because <laughs> it can be such a distraction. Um, it's obviously, I think, really critical to any author, regardless of what type of work you're publishing or where you're making your money from, you need to have, I think, some level of insight into how the business works to make smart decisions for yourself and to protect yourself. So it's... <laughs> I think one of, one of the big questions for every author that, the one that they have to face at some point if they're new is at what point does this become kind of serious? <laughs> and by serious I mean you're starting to form future plans and expectations and, and a living at, off of this and that there's something at stake. Um, for some people who are honing their craft and getting their legs under them, they're there may not be anything quite at stake yet, but as soon as there is something at stake, and I mean like more on a material level, then you have to start getting involved in what the business means and thinking strategically by putting together a, a plan that kind of states these are the goals that I have and this is how I'm going to follow through on them. Um, certainly, I think the majority of authors end up winging it and it works out okay, 
<laughs> but I sometimes our lives could be made so much easier if we only put down a few steps that we think would kind of uh, give us the information we needed to make the next best choice, whether that's networking a little bit better with the people who know more than we do, going to an event, um, reading a, a book that has some background information that could be helpful. You know, just very simple things rather than kind of this um, throwing up your hands, this is really confusing, I, <laughs> I can't keep up, um, I don't like the technology. Like, you have to kind of own all of it if you're going, if there is something at stake. Um, this is much more relevant, I think, for author publishers than for those who take the trade publishing route, at least in theory, you, to, to some degree, a, a trade contract protects you, other people go off and do the business for you, you get on, get on with the writing. Do you agree with that? Not really. Um, and I think the, the best poster child for why I say not really is C.J. Lyons, who she got her first book deal, was a really significant advance. She thought, this is it, my author career is starting, quit her job in medicine. And then, you know, months before the book was due to release, there was a conflict between her publisher and Barnes and Noble over the cover. And they killed the book over that. <laughs> and so then she was like, she was left without any real path forward. And I think she ended up leaving her agent. And then she had to just, she had, that it's just an unimaginable crossroads that would that would present you with um, to be dropped, um, kind of so brutally. So I think that it has, you know, actually played out to CJ's benefit. I mean, that has made her very aware not to be dependent on a publisher to do anything really. I mean, they're there as a partner, and there are certain parts of the deal they're supposed to uphold, but. It, that agreement can change or fall through at any moment based on changes in the industry, disagreements with other retailers or partners. You just, you never know. Oh, no, absolutely. And, I mean, CJ was only able to do what she did subsequently because self-publishing existed and she, she had that route. Um, so, and, you know, you know, I think that I think every writer should try self-publishing at least once just to find out, you know, well, first of all, to find out, do you like it or don't you? I, I actually did the thinking I wouldn't, and hey, <laughs> you know, um, but also because it gives you such a fantastic understanding of what it is to put a book together and put it in front of readers as opposed to just write it for the editor that you're speaking, the one person in the publishing house that you probably have contact with. Um, but, you know, the idea that uh, what are the qualities, I suppose what I'm, what I'm trying to, just before we, we finish up, what I'm trying to look at is the kinds of things we're talking about in terms of making money and, and the entrepreneurial uh, approach and attitude is, I agree with you, I think, pretty incompatible with, with the build up, you know, when you're trying to f get enough confidence to feel mm -hmm. that and enough judgment and proper, proper judgment of your own work and where it fits in this great uh, world of writing and, and publishing and so on and you know your own relationship with your words what you're trying to do for the reader what you're trying to do for yourself all, all of that is just such a tender little shoot that uh, bringing in you know the reaching reader stuff in the middle of that is actually I think uh, it's in some cases psychologically distressing it's 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 really yeah. we're seeing some people who are quite wounded in in that dynamic yeah. but are there actually writers in your opinion and I and I'm not talking about the thing that we see quite widely which is oh I can't do that and you know what you were talking about earlier too mm -hmm. too lazy to to you know distanced to you know mm -hmm. to the sorts of things that are really blocks that have to be yeah. overcome in order to get on with it and they're they're just mental or emotional blocks that we see people working through all the time but do you think there are some writers who just psychologically are not suited to to that route yes I do can you talk to me a little bit about that I think this is more prevalent in the literary community where I think uh, you know from the very beginning they're taught that art 
and commerce are quite separate and aren't compatible, and we touched on this a little bit earlier. And I think those people just are, are never going to embrace th that entrepreneurial spirit that's required, not because they're not smart enough or that um, they couldn't be successful at it, but it's just so um, antithetical to what they believe they should be doing or how it's going to work out in their career. Um, I did a piece recently on building a better author bio, <laughs> in part because of a personal frustration with the more literary authors who often just have like a single line. And I know, I've seen and I know that they have great bios, but they just still give me the single line. And I'm just like, what are you doing? <laughs> what? You do, it doesn't have to be like the, a narcissistic bio, but at least give me three or five lines, you know? But it and used I, to be the Trey thing, wasn't it? So and so was born here, lives there with their cat. Da dum. Yeah. The end. <laughs> and I think I, th I think that I mention this because I think it's really, it's a symbol of of what I'm talking about here of of the person who is just not. They see it as tooting their own horn. They 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 also have some feeling that anything that's good will get recognized without their help that good work gets recognized by the right people eventually, the cream rises to the top, um, and that if they're going to be celebrated or if they're going to sell, that's, that's really outside of their control, and even if they could affect it, it would be dirty uh, to, to get their hands mixed up in that. That's a very hard mindset to change. And I th those people's minds don't want to be changed. Sure. So I think they have to, they're just going to have to go about it a different way. Um, and it's not a way that I'm, I'm sure I can advise them on, but there are certainly, uh, there are certainly resources and in, in, in different routes that they, they can think about that are usually more kind of touchy-feely in the, in the print book and physical indie bookstore community and in like readings, uh, at like universities and other kind of literary mishmash events, like there's a community that they can be a part of and be involved of, and not and not feel like they're getting involved in dirty activities. But they're probably um, not going to make their living from it. No, <laughs> okay. unless you know, they hit the lottery. <laughs> okay, just finally, then, what is the one psychological? Um, quality that you feel a writer uh, needs in order to be a financial success as well as a literary success? It's probably a combination of persistence and discipline. And um, I say persistence because there are so many ups and downs and changes, particularly right now, that you can't uh, you know, you, even with just a single book, you can't you can't make or break a career on a single book. You have to have this really long-term view, and keep going despite setbacks. And by persistence, I mean like decades-long <laughs> persistence, and not allowing the small daily or even small monthly changes um, to really affect uh, your vision for what you want to accomplish. And I say discipline because I think there whatever it is that you're producing or whatever it is you have to do, you're, you're going to have to do it on a regular basis, day in and day out, regardless of the results that you're seeing. And sometimes it's very hard for people to do that without getting some sort of feedback and encouragement. Unfortunately, today's tools allow you to get that as well. But sometimes you have to muscle through it when things just don't feel that great. So, Sure. As we say around here, shut up and write. <laughs> Okay, Jane, thank you so much. Wonderful as always. Um, and very best of luck with Scratch. We'll be looking forward to, to reading the next um, issue when it's out in January. Yes. And I believe we'll actually meet in person in March at, uh, or April at Pub, Pub Smart. Yes, in, Pub Smart. Yes, looking forward to that. So um, thank you once again and enjoy the rest of your day. And um, yeah, we may have a lot of questions coming through for you as a result of this, I fear, but uh, we'll, we'll send them through to you as we usually do. Thanks yes. so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.